When I uh, first became a radio presenter for the BBC, or Auntie, as it's affectionately known, I went to a sort of radio school in London. It's where all the fledgling production assistants and presenters and newsroom staff and so on, it's where, it's where we all went. And on my first day of class, the powers that be rolled in a presenter called Alex Lester, who's remained a friend ever since. In fact, I photographed his wedding to Kerry about, oh, must be a decade ago, perhaps more now. He was, he was doing a show at the time when I first met him. He was doing a show at the, <laughs> at the hour of the day called Four, the one that has an AM in front of it. And uh, he walked into this room the picture of wonderful eccentricity that undoubtedly comes hand in hand with being made to get up at an hour of the day which is neither night nor day. It's the, the original upside down of your, of your body clock. And I know this because I've worked those shifts. I've worked quite a few years of them. So in walked Alex with a kind of trousers or pants that wouldn't have looked out of place at Billy Smart Circus on one of those clowns that rides the teeny tiny bicycles. He had, um, I think, bright red, possibly yellow, could have been green, maybe electric blue, whatever colour they were, um, shoes on. And they weren't the kind of shoes that I was used to seeing in Clark's. Do you, do, you, do you remember Clark's? Of course, there will be listeners listening now that say Clark's. No, I don't think I do, Neil, but Clark's was this shoe shop that you went to usually at the end of the school holiday. Your mum your mum dragged you in there. Come on, we're going to get shoes. Oh, no, do we have to have shoes? Yes, you need some new shoes for the new school term. Oh, no, that means school's just around the corner. Yeah, come on. Then we'll go to the haberdashery. Haberdashery? Oh, no, there was only one place where... It was haberdashery, wasn't it? Wool and pins and stuff. One place, one place worse on that tour before starting school again each year uh, that was worse than Clark's that was going to the haberdashery anyway Alex had um, long flowing curly locks and a waist jacket that was equally as colourful as his pants and I absolutely loved his eccentricity from the moment I saw him and uh, what he said to us in his opening lesson to us fledgling yafflers who hadn't yet been let loose on the unknowing public has remained with me. Actually, I met a couple of people, uh, Alex, and there was a producer as well, and I forget who said what, so, um, but I'm pretty sure it was Alex that said, when you're on the wireless, wonderful, old, old school term, when, when you're on the wireless, there's only one person you're talking to. Remember that, he said, one person. Address one person. Um, think of somebody, he said, as we sat down, and, um, tried to find our our one person think of somebody he said remember them and then when you've got them firmly in your mind don't tell anybody what they look like nothing nothing at all like a a private mantra nobody should know they're yours and yours alone and so was born the other listener and I've kept reasonably loyal to that concept, really. It's, it's my mechanism for breaking the fourth wall of radio, or podcasting in this instance. It's like being allowed to, an imaginary friend for the whole of your adult life. In fact, it's not really like having one. It is having one. Though in this case, I don't run the risk of being carted away to explain myself to somebody with lots of letters after their name. It's a perfect way that I find, some secrets of the show now, uh, a perfect way that I find for being, um, for being personable. And it doesn't matter whether you have one listener, as I'm sure I did in the very early days of working on hospital radio. Thousands, as we fortunately do on this podcast, or millions, as I was privileged in a scary way to experience just for a few years in the 90s. It doesn't matter. It always comes down to, to one person. That's who you're talking to, one person. Although I have oddly stretched that because uh, there's you and there's my other listener. Which makes me feel in an odd way that I'm cheating on my imaginary other listener. Nurse, the screen's quick. Anyway, the reason for telling you all this at the start of today's show is that I'm going to break Alex's golden rule. And I'm going to say now, you lot are just wonderful. Yes, you. You and you. You and you and you. And you, and even the, yeah, 
you, and even the other listener, who's often quite grumpy with me, granted. The letters you send into this show and the efforts you make to respond to stuff said or the stories you tell, which are often deeply personal, and there's one of those coming up today, uh, just completely floor me. In a positive sense, that is. And the, uh, and the backgrounds and the backstories that you have just completely pull the rug out. They really do. That's not to say that you have to have grand stories, <laughs> because every mail sent is important, right down to the Oi, Neil, here's a picture of some ducks at dawn just because they're fab. They're all important. So thank you, really, deeply, from the bottom of my heart and, um, and the bottom of Alex's very weird, clown-like, colourful pants, because they really do make this such a, an honour and a joy, this podcast, to, uh, to present. I just thought I'd share that ahead of the show. Anyway, my guest today is a super photojournalist called Howard Barlow. Today on The Photo Walk. I suppose I'm a bit kind of squirmish in many ways, but I guess when you're looking behind a camera, it's looking through a lens, isn't it? It's like looking at a television. I got a call very early in the morning and uh, went down to uh, Manchester Airport. And obviously at that point, everything was cut off and there was a perimeter all around the airport. Yeah, you feel bad about winning an award, don't you, for somebody else's loss? Yeah, I always try and cover them in a very sensitive way. Uh, So we sort of went in the building, got onto his roof, and then we were virtually eyeball to eyeball with the uh, the prisoners that documentation isn't it you know that going back looking at those street pictures looking at the music pictures you know the Ramones and people like that they just can't be done again now that's Howard Barlow my guest on the show today and one of the gentler giants I think you'll find in the photojournalism world welcome along then as we make our photo walks together a show where we walk and make pictures, photographically sketchbooking our time together each week, enjoying the letters and inspirational stories you sent in and listening back to special studio conversations with guests from around the world. I'll take a peek into that mailbag in a moment for a flavour of today's letters into the show. But before that, if you've been hearing their name but haven't tried them yet then today is that day to go online to mpb.com and become a part of the biggest and best online place to buy, sell and trade your used photo and video gear if you're in the UK, US or Europe. If you have camera gear in your life that you're not using, it could become new to somebody else and make you some money along the way. So if you're selling, it's easy to do. Just go to mpb.com at the top of the page, click on Start Selling and Trading and follow the simple instructions which all leads to an instant quote which if you're happy with, you accept, you print off a label, you stick it on a box with your gear in it and a delivery driver will come and collect it from your front door. Once MPB receive and check what you've sent, you get paid quick smart into your account. You can, of course, buy camera gear too, and there's a huge amount to choose from because MPB recirculate 570,000 cameras, lenses and accessories a year. So buy, sell and trade used camera gear with MPB. If you're in the States, the UK or Europe, go to mpb.com and I will, of course, have a link on the show page today, plus a new pictorial one. Right, on the show today, a hat full of first-time writers, which is good. We talk design that makes life easier, photography that makes life happier, and learn how photography was an ever-present friend in the face of physical adversity. There are several whys of photography to answer, and atop that, Marissa Roth, the Pulitzer Prize-winning photojournalist, answers, I think, a question of ethics. And there's also the final chance to take part in this month's One Word Assignment. Shall we walk then? Checklist out. Coffee, check. Garibaldi's, definitely check. Very colourful walking pants. Does grey count? No. Walking boots, check. SD cards or a spare roll of film, check. Well, let's walk. It's a bit windy woo today, as my mum used to say. Uh, I am looking across the way here, just through the gap in the uh, the trees, just there. I can see it, Neil. Can you? There. Yeah, just there. There's um, what looks like a tiger moth. One of the um, one of those biplanes, tiger moth. It was used as a trainer plane, I think, during World War II, possibly before. It's a wonderful aeroplane. I um, I once got bought a trip in a tiger moth by Sam. <laughs> 
not quite sure what she was saying, putting me in a 70-year-old aircraft, possibly more. But uh, it was very it was very twitchy. It really was. It bounced around in the sky. And it's a bit windy today. And I'm looking at this biplane, whether it's a tiger moth or not, I don't know. But thinking, cool, I bet, it, <laughs> bet it's a bit bumpy up there. Anyway, I say at the start of the show most weeks, and I completely mean it, but you really do give this podcast and community a real uniqueness with our letters and your thoughts and the pictures. So please never stop sending them in. And uh, together we'll continue with our cameras to find escapism and peace away from the noise of this world, putting miles under our feet and making a picture or two to remind us of where those footprints were left. And... In the spirit of those thoughts, I'm starting with a letter from Michael Brennan with some work that I've been meaning to mention for a long, long time now. Uh, but the letter is about... Uh, the, the work is something that Michael has done. The letter has... Uh, well, it's got design in it, photographs and music. And we'll start with the design bit and then we'll move on to the pictures and I'll have a bit of a surprise in terms of the musical bit. Well, I think it's a surprise at, uh, at any rate. And I shall have to dive behind my sofa of flattery at the same time because there are some flattering words about the show to come initially. Uh, You'll find, by the way, uh, as you do with all the pictures we talk about on the show, uh, from the letters sent in, you'll find pictures from Michael and links to his work and a website I'm about to mention and, uh, and some music. Yes, music on the show page today. Hello, Neil. I've never written into the show, although I support your effort via Patreon. You're very, very kind. I carry gratitude for your courage to put this show into the world the way that you have. It's hard to find those that understand the power of story, and you are a master of the story, Michael. Already my face has flushed just slightly. I'm shifting nervously on my pegs, and the sofa of flattery that I drag behind me is getting dickensingly, new word alert, I think so anyway, is getting dickensingly heavier like the uh, the chains of an oddly welcome burden of sorts. Anyway, Michael says, I'm an older fella. Michael, I've seen a picture of you. You mean more mature. You don't mean an older fella. You're like a fine Italian wine um, who left a, a career to start a small design studio in Detroit to help government institutions remove friction from how they can help communities and people. Letting the humanity in. We're a small team of 20 trying to make a a meaningful impact on the world. The organisation is called Sevilla. Sevilla. Now, Michael, I went to your website, and my word, what an organisation. With strap lines like, we're building a more beautiful civil society for all. I mean, (laughs) who doesn't want that? particularly now. So, uh, yes, I love the idea of how you're helping to make institutions that are out there help people um, and seem less scary. How you're helping normal, everyday folk to understand the, uh, the behemoth of complicated forms. My God, I have enough sitting in my inbox that I'm too scared to look over at the moment, as it is. Do you, th- do you think when people write forms whether they're tax ones or benefits or, or whatever, do you, do you think they actually read them back? Because I'm sure they don't. Because if they did, they'd think, what on earth does that mean? I'm sure it, like, it gets to the end of the day, that, well, that, that's the form done, I'm going home. Honestly, I can't do any more. Now, some of the amazing things your non-profit does, Michael, um, some of it, I'm going to be honest, went slightly over my head. I do think my creative mind seems to have wired itself more emotionally than intellectually. But um, let me tell you what Michael's organisation has already helped to do through design and redesign work of uh, scary, scary complex forms. And I know you're thinking, hang on, it's a photography show, but design's all part of it. Because of Michael's team, it takes less than 20 minutes for Michigan residents to apply for benefits, which I'm assuming is a lot, lot less than it used to. Because of Michael's team, using your mobile phone, you can now get assistance to heat your home if you've hit hard times and the money just isn't there in less than 10 minutes, which I'm sure, really sure, is much, much less than it used to be. And because of Michael and his team, America's longest benefits application is, get this, 80% shorter. 
So you, Michael, and your team are very special humans, and I feel honoured that you're a listener. I don't know whether any of the team are, but you're a listener and a supporter of this show. Anyway, Michael writes, photographically, to get back on the... Uh, the photography. I take whatever time I can to follow my curiosity and study nature. I've been photographing a very small river in northern Michigan along the Sleeping Bear National Lakeshore, that sounds idyllic, for the past three years, and I've created a zine called River Sacred. I continue to observe that river, and I've started on a nearby creek using mostly film on long-expired cameras. There's, uh, there's so much wonder before our eyes, says Michael, or as my father used to say, miracles are happening all around us. Be well, Neil. Keep trusting your calling. The world needs you. <laughs> and again, that that, oh, that 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 sofa's getting heavier. Oh, and you might like to know that I've been creating a playlist out of your play out songs. Not a perfect list, but it's up to 75. Here's the Spotify link, and the list is called Go Photo. So, <laughs> Michael... Firstly, thank you for your stories, the pictures, the thoughts about the miracles we see through our, our camera eyepieces, but especially for the Spotify link to the Go Photo playlist. I was, uh, I, I was, I was just uh, gobsmacked, to use a, an 80s phrase. I really was. I thought, look at that. That's fantastic. Uh, for those, and I hope there's not too many, but for those who haven't made it to the final part of the show, for whatever reasons, at the end of the show, I have a play-out song, which um, I've included for uh, for a few reasons, really. One, I'd never heard a photographic podcast include music the way we do, and that includes the musical interludes between our walking pieces. Two, it made me feel like I, w I was presenting a show with a closing theme, uh, a sort of homage to uh, to my days in radio. But three, I really wanted to have a song that just put a sort of ellipsis at the uh, at the end of the show, so it didn't come to a boof, hard stop. Um, a sort of that's it, see you next week. There's no more. But it gave you some breathing space to think about what you just heard on the show and make some. And I mean this, and make some more pictures as we walk a bit further along our paths together. So there's been some method. <laughs> in my format and it's something that you voted to keep in our annual show survey that goes out so i'm assuming you like it in the main i've actually been asked from time to time to share what songs we use which is uh, why on the show page i'm i'm delighted to now include a link to the the play out song and i promise though i've not yet made it to make some music shows that just feature these play out songs with uh, perhaps a a short something for inspiration between them so well i still plan to do that it, it will come it's on the list of the long list of things what i plan to do so i am absolutely thrilled that you've uh, essentially produced the album of the show michael so uh, <laughs> in order to properly recognize your efforts on the show page this week, you will find a pictorial link that will take you each week to Michael's Go Photo playlist on Spotify. Most of the songs we've used, most of them I think, many of them most, uh, they're there with a few extra surprises that thematically work, that are popped in from Michael. As for your pictures to go with your photographic thoughts, they will also be on the show page. As Michael says, right at the end of his letter exchange with me, the, uh, the intersection of voice, music and an image is something I hope to explore more. Stay close to your hunches. They're leading you and others to a much needed place in an otherwise chaotic world. I, c I couldn't agree with you more, Michael. And uh, for work above and beyond uh, for the show, I think it's only fair you receive. We haven't given one of these out for a while now from the mailbag. I'm going to send you a, sh a shiny new famous, not so famous flask. Sir Barkalot will be in touch uh, for your address. If you have a picture or letter to send in, like uh, Michael Brennan, and are gently nudged by anything that you hear today, send them to stories at photowalk.show. Stories at photowalk.show. There is, by the way, another Michael Brennan in the world of photography, and I've no doubt there will be 
somebody listening saying, oh, oh, Michael Brennan, Neil. Michael Brennan, do you mean the American-British press photographer? Not in this case, no, but there is. Yes, there is uh, another Michael Brennan who is the American-British press photographer. And I shall leave a link on the show page to his work because he was um, a very special photographer. Born in Sheffield, Yorkshire, this other Michael Brennan began his career as a runner and then a news photographer for the Croydon Times between 64 and 1970. He worked in the north of England as a photographer for the the regional offices of the Sunday People and uh, the Daily Herald. He first gained notice for a series of photographs of the death of Donald Campbell, who died while attempting the world water speed record in 1967. The photos appeared in Life magazine and won him the British News Picture of the Year Award, which is interesting because I have a question coming up for my guest today about being awarded uh, accolades for essentially pictures of um, of, uh, of suffering or because they are they're grim pictures really the, the pictures of Donald Campbell because you you know exactly what uh, history tells us exactly what happened when his boat flipped it's a sort of tight rope I suppose all photojournalists tread but uh, Michael took uh, took other less grim pictures of course um, such as the famous photograph of a very well costumed and body painted Lady Liberty getting into a yellow cab in New York that was his some uh, iconic collections of Muhammad Ali, and I'll leave some links on the, uh, the show page today for his work. Right, some show news, which I'd like your help on. Next week's episode is one of our walking and talking types with, um, with a guest. I go to the Cotswolds in England and take a walk with Chris Floyd, who is a British photographer who spent decades photographing some of the biggest names in music and film and culture. In the show, we talk about a couple of particular shoots, including his introduction to the Royals and a portrait with a late... Uh, great Christopher Reeve, which is a story he and I, uh, I, th- I think, particularly invested in, uh, because Christopher was, uh, you know how they say you have a bond, or in the UK perhaps, you know, you, ha- you, have, your, you have your Doctor Who. My, my Doctor Who was, uh, I think, a bit of a mixture between John Pertwee and Tom Baker, that, that sort of period. But uh, Christopher was our Superman, so we talk about him. Um, there's more stories atop that, of course. And then, and then the week after, this is where I need your help, for the edition on the 8th of November, my guest is Sean Tucker, who's a, a great friend of the show. He, he's going to be uh, coming back for the special that I've been talking about for a little while now. It's a, a special on imposter syndrome. He actually made a film about imposter syndrome uh, quite recently, which I will um, link to on the show page today. Uh, But we're going to talk about imposter syndrome, confidence, perfectionism, because that's something that runs deep with a lot of creatives. I know that's something that affects the amount of work that I can can put out into the world. Inadequacy, we'll talk about comparison anxiety, self-doubt, fear of failure, and undervaluing accomplishments. (laughs) Blimey, Neil. All in one show, yes, all in one show. But I want this to be an episode of positivity. Uh, I'd like to address any concerns that you have about these topics. And so, to that extent, you have a week to write in. I'd like to hear from you with any questions, experiences and thoughts about the list, which I will publish in this week's newsletter. Do you, do you receive the newsletter? Have you signed up for the new, new, new newsletter? Uh, so I'll, I'll pop that in the newsletter as a reminder. Now, it's important with subjects such as this that you feel safe to ask questions or comments. So to that extent, if you do wish to remain anonymous, please uh, make sure you tell me in your emailed question and we will be sure, both myself and Sean, will be sure to to honour that. Right into the the regular address that we have, stories at photowalk.show. Stories at photowalk.show. Right, part one of my chat with my guest today, Howard Barlow. He is a British photojournalist whose career has spanned decades, capturing some of the most iconic moments in music and culture, major events and everyday life. Punk, post-punk, Howard was there. Let me introduce you to Howard Barlow for part one of our chat. 
Howard, I noted that first and foremost within your bio, you're very keen to be known as a photojournalist and not as a rock musician photographer or politics or arts photographer or theatre photographer. It's a it's a 50 year journey. This um, oh, actually, it's a little bit more, isn't it? And and it would seem that to be stamped with a niche is not what you want because you've done so much more with your life, haven't you? I think so, yes. I mean, I've never really specialised in any particular area of photography. I think that's probably part of my, you know, starting photography in the 70s and certainly, you know, late 70s, 80s on, on the national papers. You were expected to be the sports photographer, the features, etc. It was great for me. So, you know, I never got bored. You were always doing something very different and never knew where you were going to be sent next or, or what sort of photography genre it would be. Well, there was one article I read about you where, where and this does sound terrifically romantic, uh, that, that you would literally be wandering the streets with your red dotted camera. Um, <laughs> I used to like that, um, just wandering around. I think I think when I, I was on a local paper, and um, but I always kind of wanted to be that 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 magnum photographer, you know, the the, the Don McCullen type of person roaming around and talking with people. So I used to take days out and go to you know Salford and Moss Side and Liverpool and just wander around the streets and chat with people, you know, rag and bone man or or whoever it might be. And just follow them around for half an hour, an hour or so, and uh, just try and get into their lives and uh, create pictures. And um, I enjoyed that side of things. It's interesting that you mentioned Don McCullen because that's that's really how he started, wasn't it? When you when you look at those East End shots. You're spending time with people, just in, in investing your time with others, and from there the stories come. Yeah, no, no. Tom McCullum was a, was a real um, influence, inspiration, really. Mm. And I think his latter book, um, Homecoming, after all the the war photography, I think that book particularly and the pictures in the northeast were uh, yeah amazing pictures. And yeah, I just love that black and white as well. I think I think I uh, mind things in black and white even even nowadays. I feel lucky that I had the opportunity to uh, have a... Well, it was a sort of a form of an apprenticeship at a local newspaper, not not in the photographic side, but in the journalistic side. And it introduced me to a, a proper grumpy sub-editor who believed in me enough to suggest that I might ha- have something to offer journalism. He'd never go further than might. And that, that was praise indeed from old Ron. Now, as it turned out, I decided not to follow old Ron's advice. I wish I had often, but uh, there will be forever a chapter in my book of what ifs. But you, you had that opportunity to work in regional news and you took it with open arms by the sound of it. I did, yes. I, I, I mean, I started off um, at art college, like at 1971, like all the kind of uh, hippies in those days, you did your art college and then dropped out after six months. So I love that. I did a, a ground course in um, in arts, which, yeah, I was told by my art teacher at school I wasn't very good at art, but I, I still felt very creative. So I wanted to go to art college and the ground course was, um, you did a little bit, a little bit of fashion, a bit of graphic design and a bit of photography. And I just fell in love with being in the dark room and uh, yeah, that magic of the print coming through and the, the smell of the chemicals. Mm. And then from there, I went to, uh, I stayed in the dark room. I, I went to a photographer called uh, Desmond Groves, who was the royal photographer at the time. So this was 1971, 72. Um, he was doing pictures of the royal family. And then he'd bring the negatives back to, to Wilmslow, where he was based. And uh, I would be involved in printing some of the black and white pictures of the royal family, which was which was great fun. So if they had a little bit of speck of dust on them, he'd rip them all up. And so it was a great sort of a uh, dark room training for me. Good. And then, uh, I, yeah, I stuck with that for about a year and then uh, joined the Warrington Guardian series of newspapers, which was 22 regional papers throughout Cheshire and Lancashire. That, that process, how did that then become more of the national newspapers and working for, I don't want to say larger titles, because actually the Manchester titles... It is a country in itself by the stories we'll talk about in a short while, actually. But how did that transition come along? Um, I did the three years um, indenture period at the, at the Warrington Guardian series. And then I, uh, I mean, dur- and during that time, the kind of music photography came in. I had this great love for, for music and started covering mm-hmm. concerts and uh, trying to blag my way into getting a, a concert pass. But there, were, there was only probably a couple of us in Manchester doing uh, music photography at that time. So it was quite a good time to get into the music photography. But no, I, I applied for a job at an agency in Wigan, which was a national agency that, that covered the national papers so i would uh, kind of fully agency to cover the the night shift at the daily mail for instance or the or the daily express so you'd go on about five o'clock in the evening and finish about one or two in the morning so you know typical midweek 
five o'clock shift, you'd probably go down to Old Trafford for seven, seven thirty to cover the match or over to Anfield to do the Liverpool match or, you know, or get sent up to Newcastle or, or, or something like that. Yeah. I, I wonder if, if uh, maybe you don't, but um, whether we lament the, the loss of some of the, the opportunities that, that having a fully staffed photographic department used to have. I don't think that even exists in, in really to, to any great extent in the national newspapers now, does it? Many, many countries I've spoken with American titles who say, well, that office is a bit depleted now. Yes, I mean, certainly I, my first, after the agency, I got a, I got offered a job on the Daily Mirror. So I was only kind of 24 or something. Uh, I think nowadays all the photographers are very young, aren't they? But uh, in those days, I was probably the youngest by about 15 years. <laughs> and uh, there was 12 or 15 staff photographers yeah. just based in Manchester. So a, a lot of days we'd just hang around, you know, waiting for the, waiting for a phone call in the, in the uh, photographer's office. And uh, yeah, some days we wouldn't go out at all. But yeah, it was a very different setup, wasn't it? Yeah. It was sort of, you know, local paper to agency to national paper. And that was the way things kind of happened in those days. In terms of the, uh, the, the titles who you were working for, and I know the broadsheets were broadly what you were attracted to, but um, in, in terms of the, uh, the tabloid newspapers, did you ever work for, say, The, say the Sun? No, I mean, I was offered a job on the Daily Mirror and, and it was very un-me, as it were, in terms of, you know, my style of photography was very much, you know, that, that kind of Guardian yeah. Sunday Times, or I, I like to think it was, uh, independent. But I got offered the job on the Mirror at the age of 24. I wouldn't, wasn't going to turn it down. No. So and I think the Mirror was a very different paper in those days. It was very much, a, you know, a Labour campaigning paper with writers like Paul Foote. Yeah, it was less, I think, less celebrity uh, in those days, yeah. Actually, Manchester in the 80s and 90s was rich pickings, wasn't it, for a photographer who had a keen eye for a story. The uh, IRA bombing, the infamous prison riot, a, a visit from the Pope in nicer times, and there was that horrific airliner fire at uh, Manchester Airport. For, for a, a, Still a young uh, photographer. How do such events shape your approach and your feelings about the the world because you're thrust into i think as a as a newspaper photographer some fairly horrific scenes sometimes yeah i, I suppose i'm a bit kind of squirmish in many ways but i guess when you're looking behind a camera it's looking through a lens isn't it it's like looking at a television um you mentioned the manchester air crash and i got a call i think it was a sunday times or the, or the independent i was working with uh, as a freelance and uh, i got a call very early in the morning and uh, went down to uh, manchester airport and obviously at that point everything was cut off and there was a perimeter all around the airport and uh, there was a barn that I knew on one of the side roads, which overlooked the runway. So I went to this barn to get a shot, you know, I guess a 200 mil shot of the, of the aircraft that had, uh, had crashed. And uh, sat next to me was um, Eric Shaw, who was the great um, PA photographer based in Manchester. And he had um, Ilford film in his camera and I had Kodak film in my camera. And um, the awards at the end of the year, he won the Ilford Photographer of the Year and I got the Kodak Photographer of the Year with virtually the same picture. Yeah. Not a nice subject to get, get an award for, is it? But um, it's interesting. That, that does raise a question, though, how you feel as a, as a photographer, as a human, to be awarded for, for photographs of situations that are, are often, well, they, they can be quite gruesome. Yeah, you feel bad about winning an award, don't you, for somebody else's loss? Yeah, I always try and cover them in a very sensitive way. I remember that, you know, after, after Hillsborough, the, the, the first funeral, I was covering for the Independent after Hillsborough. And, um, you know, rather than focus in on the, on the, on the kind of relatives with the tears coming down their faces, as it were, I, I photographed the crowd and just a very kind of a blurred type shot of the, of the, of the sort of the coffin coming past. I, you know, try and be sensitive as I can and, 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 and photograph you know the people on uh, Hillsborough on the uh, terraces at Anfield in the days after yeah you feel very vulnerable don't you, you feel yeah. as though you're pointing a lens at somebody and but I think it's it's news isn't it and you have to be as sensitive as you can and to portray that, uh, that story to the, uh, the newspaper on the the subject of access which is perhaps the most important element of any kind of journalism or photojournalism um, the prison riot pictures which you can see on your website there was um, for, for me that felt like you'd you gained a particular kind of access. You you had a view of that uh, what was famous in the UK anyway that that news story that others didn't appear to have. We were virtually yeah. There was a um, a very uh, enterprising um, 
guy who owned the uh, the building opposite, I guess a factory type of building, and uh, he was charging all the photographers something like fifty pounds a day to go up onto his roof. Uh, so we sort of went in the building, got onto his roof, and then we were virtually eyeball to eyeball with the uh, the prisoners. But I think uh, at the end of the day, I think the guy who rented his roof out for fifty pounds a time, I think he probably had a very large bill to pay for his <laughs> his roof, <laughs> uh, which was probably a bit of a wreck by the time we finished with it. He, he, in mates were very much using the, the the journalists and the photographers to to portray their story and had that sort of conversation through banners and uh, posters and things so they were they were specifically pointing at you really with a lot of this weren't they yeah they had they had a, an agenda and uh, you know a fair gripe about the conditions that they were they were living under when when we talk about how people use the use photographers and photography it's changed of late hasn't it i mean i remember a particularly interesting conversation i was having with a with a photographer who talked about how the ira used to use photographers and invite them to be behind them so they would photograph over their shoulders um, back towards the the British army so it looked like the aggressor was the other side now, it's become a different thing now hasn't it the way that people view photographers and in some respects photographers talk of um, there being less respect for them yeah, I think so. I mean, I, th- I suppose that the biggest time I felt ashamed of being a photographer was, um, you know, after after Diana was uh, had died in in that car crash, and uh, I know, you know, the very that very day I was out in Liverpool photographing um, some event at the Liverpool Town Hall, but yeah, you you could feel the eyes being on you as being, you know, you're you're the person responsible for killing Diana or, or whatever. Yeah, I think we carry quite a weight sometimes, don't we, photographers? Do you think the relationship with um, with newspapers that was 1997, so it's a fair while back now. But do you yeah. do you do you think the relationship with newspaper photographers? Do you do you sense that that was a turning point? I think so. Yes. I mean, there's, there's a lot more intrusive work by newspapers, isn't there? Into well, I guess there was then, in you know, the, in, in the days that certainly in the mirror days with the kind of phone hacking and things like that you felt uh, things weren't quite above board in many ways when i look at your news portfolio a lot of the earlier stories were, were black and white am i right I'm, i was just trying to remember last night the first color newspaper in the uk at any rate wasn't that eddie Shaw's today newspaper i did look it up and i saw the today newspaper masthead and i was i don't recall any other papers being specifically all full of color how did how did that change your your career? That's right, it was, wasn't it, Eddie Shaw? Yes, and, and uh, I think it was Eddie Shaw who took over the the Warrington Guardian series, which I was uh, originally ah. started. Ah. He was proprietor of the Messenger, which was the the rival local paper, and he bought out the uh, the Warrington Guardian as well, uh, I believe. And th- and then and then I, th- I guess that was the beginning of the uh, the staff issues in Manchester, wasn't it? The the offices closing down at the mirror, at the Mirror and the Express and the other the other buildings there. So yeah, Eddie Shaw, um, the colour newspapers. Yeah, we started shooting in, in with Cullen Cullen Egmore then and, and Cullen Tranny. But in terms of, of of how I approach the ph- photography, I think I think all this. You know, I mentioned before I was thinking black and white, and I guess I still take the picture, even though it was a colour negative. I I would still shoot it as I would, mm. you know, on Tri-X or or Fuji film, whatever. When did you start? You met, you mentioned the rock musicians. You started while you were at the newspapers do, doing that. I, I like I like the fact that you said you were blagging your way in. There's some particularly well blagged concerts in that case. Then the good fortune of photographing Freddie Mercury, your reasonably famous photograph of, of uh, Paul McCartney and Wings across from the Liver Building. I'd say. What were you doing, and how you how were you getting into to these these positions with with musicians like Paul McCartney? Yeah, I, I guess you know art college. The reason I got into photography was you know I loved music, I loved photography. Um, so doing the concerts was a, a kind of a natural progression, really. And it was difficult, yes, to get a pass. You know, if you're on the local Altrium Guardian to get a pass for uh, Queen or um, Neil Young or whatever, it was uh, they didn't really recognise you. Neil Young, for instance, um, he was playing in 1973, so I'd be what 19. He was playing at the uh, Manchester Palace Theatre. I got a ticket for the concert, so I buy a ticket for the concert, um, which was about fifteen bob. Not not quite the same price as an Oasis ticket nowadays. Good God, no! <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, the, in fact, the the, the support band to Neil Young were the Eagles in 1973, which wow, was interesting. Wow. I remember that concert very well because Neil Young came on and played, um, it was promoting the Tonight's the Night tour where he had quite a heavy 
beard and uh, he played the first half the first half of the concert he played all that album and uh, everybody was hoping he'd play songs from Heart of Gold and After the Gold Rush etc um, then he came on for the second half and said I'm going to play you something you've all heard before now and he played the same set again <laughs> after the cover <laughs> but uh, no that was it so I, I kind of snuck off a couple of pictures on my 200 mil lens um in fact in fact it was literally one picture i took and uh there were no photographers allowed on that tour at all and it was interesting 40 years later i got a call from neil young's manager saying you know we've seen your shot on um i think it had been used on a documentary on bbc or something and rolling stone magazine and melody maker have used it a couple of times um he said you know i've seen your your picture and uh, we'd love to use it on neil young's new um upcoming anthology cd or whatever it was have you got any more shots and i said well actually no because you <laughs> let any photographers take pictures during that time and i just got the one picture so <laughs> it was pretty ironic wasn't it what, what what about musicians like mccartney what's it like directing um the, those who know the business of, of image like like paul definitely does that that was um i think it was up to the telegraph it was probably wings's first tour after the beatles split and uh, it was on the on the ferry on the River Mersey. And I think the ferry was the first one of the first concerts the Beatles played on the ferry. And uh, he was very relaxed. Yeah, I remember talking to to Linda McCartney about um, about photography, and uh, she was very nice to talk to. But Paul was very good. He, he just kind of spent most of the time just talking to the the cleaner on the on on board the boat and things like that. And there's a very poignant picture of uh, of Yoko Ono outside. Uh, well. Strawberry Field Forever on, yes, on, on the scribbled forever and, underneath the on, sign on yes. the post but behind her. Well, that was just after uh, John uh, had died. Yeah. Um, Yoko came over with Sean, who was about, I guess, 10, 10 or twelve at yeah, the time. Yeah. She visited all the, all the kind of sites in Liverpool that were uh, relevant to John's life. Yeah, well, it wasn't an official photo call or anything like that, but we we managed to get hold of uh, information where they would be and uh, just waited. A lot of photography is about patience, isn't it? Yeah, I think one of the things I like about photojournalism is is, is sort of just going into a situation. You have to think on your feet, don't you, sometimes? And uh, going into, you know, you were asked to photograph oh, I know, Margaret Atwood, say, um, and she was doing a book launch in Manchester. And uh, you're given like kind of literally five minutes with her. And I like I like that having to think on your feet. You know, I put I put her next to it was at the uh, Malmaison Hotel opposite Piccadilly Station where she arrived, and I sat her next to this lovely open window, and there was a, a kind of a velvet curtain which I pulled across, and it almost you know a bit Rembrandt, Rembrandt type of lighting. I, I just love that having to think on your feet. You know, I think PR photography or something like that it's all very staged, and you think about it, etc. Whereas I think photojournalism, you just got to think straight away. I remember working for um, a doctor magazine for, for quite a few years and uh, it would always be the same you know you'd photograph the doctor in his surgery with his, his uh, stethoscope around his neck but having to do that every week and trying to make each picture different every week was uh, was quite a challenge and uh, you know a challenge i like and howard barlow returns for part two of our conversation shortly but not before i talk to another guest actually about a question I'm not, sh- I'm not sure that I investigated properly in my chat there with Howard. And that's this question of awards in the face of human adversity. It's just something on a human level that does intrigue me. So I'm pulling in the help of a long-time friend of the show, Marissa Roth, an international photojournalist and team winner of a Pulitzer Prize for her part in the coverage of the LA riot, which in 1992... Uh, resulted in 52 deaths, two and a half thousand injuries, and at least $446 million of property damage. So I want to investigate, because Marissa was part of the team that won a Pulitzer Prize for for that extraordinary work, I want to investigate the question a, a little bit more about receiving accolades, awards, for work which features human suffering. And I, I thought Marissa would be... Um, perfect for 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 talking about that particular subject now here's a letter from josh solos this has been uh, maturing in the inbox now for a little while hi neil my name is josh solos i'm a long-time listener but a first-time writer i feel there should be some sort of trumpet voluntary at this moment josh um (laughs) like something from a peter sellers or mel brooks film where a trumpeter comes uh, walking from out of the bush with a trumpet. 
to make an announcement. First time writer. I'm a, I'm a street photographer, says Josh, and a concert photographer based out of Vancouver, British Columbia, and the son of Jim Solos, another photographer who's been featured on your show before. And I'm writing to formally say thank you, really, for the podcast that you put together. You see, I just knew, Josh, there could not be two solos in one place in the world without there being some sort of connection. Back in 2020, says Josh, two life-changing things happened to me. I met the woman who's now my fiancé, but just two months later, I was diagnosed with a spinal tumour that would eventually paralyse me from the waist down. I took time off work as I waited for my surgery date, and given we were in the middle of a pandemic, I spent most of my days laying around the house with nothing but my thoughts to keep me occupied. I've been a, a street photographer for many years at this point, and being stripped of the ability to go out and do the hobby that I love was soul-crushing. I made your podcast part of my daily ritual. I'd wake up, put on the podcast and would find something in my house to take a photo of. Of course, at that time, we were um, doing up to five shows a week uh, in, it, in, its, in its other guise as, um, as Photography Daily, weren't we, before it became the photo walk. It kept my mind off uh, my situation and kept my creative juices flowing. I uh, decided to start a photography project called Rise and Fall, shot entirely on film. Well, when I got out of surgery, I was completely paralysed from the waist down despite having what's called an incomplete injury. An incomplete spinal injury has the chance, though, to recover. As a street photographer, the prospect of not being able to walk the streets anymore was, was terrifying, as I'm sure you could probably imagine. During my first month in the hospital, I would roll around it in a wheelchair, making photographs of anything that crossed my path. I wanted to capture the mood and remember my experience despite the immense pain that I was in because nerve pain had rendered even the slightest movement excruciatingly painful. A few weeks passed and my partner had the idea to put me in the wheelchair and roll me around the streets this time of Vancouver. I, it, was, it was literally and figuratively a breath of fresh air. It was my old stomping grounds, but from an entirely different perspective. I've now got that low dramatic angle so many photographers have to stoop down to achieve silver linings and all that, says Josh. Well, I kept it up, going downtown whenever I could and capturing photographs, but what I didn't expect was my biggest nemesis to date, hills. Pushing up a hill in a wheelchair is no joke. Pushing up a hill in a wheelchair with a camera wrapped around your neck is nearly impossible. Fortunately, though, I was able to get a motorised assistance device that attaches to the chair and pushes me up hills to get those shots that would otherwise be out of reach. I guess that's um, the equivalent to this sort of assistance you're able to get for, for bikes. I remember that first day in hospital, says Josh, when I realised I could twitch one of the muscles in my right leg. Fast forward a bit and I could flex the muscle so it would straighten out my leg. From there, I started to regain some function, painstakingly, slowly, but I was regaining function. The day arrived when I was able to put my feet on the ground and throw myself into the chair, followed by the next step, where I would put my hands on a table and try and hold myself in a standing position. Months later, I was able to stand up off the edge of my bed and hug my partner, standing for the first time in almost a year, and then to today, whilst I still have the chair for long distances and photo excursions, I can get around for a good distance with just a cane. The human body's ability to recover can be quite incredible. I'll never likely be able to get fully rid of my chair, but what I've gotten back has helped me immensely, both from a photographic and a life perspective. Since I've been able to use the cane, I've gotten into concert photography and started photographing my partner's band. This has spiralled into photographing other bands in the Vancouver area. And oh my goodness, Neil, I can't tell you how much fun that type of photography is. Anyway, this is just my long-winded way of saying thank you. Whether it was at home, moping about my situation, lying in hospital in pain, or rolling around the streets of Vancouver taking photographs. The photo walk has always been a part of that journey. Photography 
is such an amazing hobby, says Josh. Rooted itself, it has in my raison d'etre. I'll attach some photos from my project, from my street work and from my concert work. I apologise in advance. They're probably not going to be resized the way you like, so you'll have to forgive me. Enjoy your next walk with Sir lot. Wishing you all the best from Canada land. Josh Solos. Well, he's, um, he's given me um, his Instagram um, addresses for both his street and concert work. I will make sure I put those on the show page, along with some photographs that uh, Josh very kindly sent that we can include on the uh, the show page. I have to say, um, yeah, I, I'm... I'm speechless. First up, your story of courage and resilience, and I suppose that can-do spirit that just says, I'll be f***ed if I'm going to accept this. Excuse my language, mother. Is truly incredible. That this community has been a part of that journey is frankly really, really humbling. It, 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 it is. It's letters like this and the opening one that really do underline why I've personally invested so much time into this show but perhaps Josh I'm finding a new why it's stories like this plus of course all the day-to-day ones of life as a creative that make me really really very proud to be the uh, the baton carrier if that's the right phrase or the or the chief chatterbox with a mailbag Alex used to call himself that I'm sure chief chatterbox now I usually promote forward to, uh, to the extra mile at the end of the episode, but it seems appropriate and pertinent that I do it now because Josh mentioned at the start of his letter his father, Jim, who's, um, who's a bit of a whiz in the darkroom and a mentor to many photographers. Uh, now, we spoke, myself and Jim, a long time ago about his approach to photography and teaching, and I think it's likely that we may have spoken at the time when perhaps he was caring for you sometimes. I'm not quite sure about that, but I I think it may have been anyway. There was a conversation that um, part of it has never really been aired on the... Well, I don't think it's been aired on the Extra Mile at all. No, I know it's never been aired on the Extra Mile. I think it might have been in part on the more episodes, which goes back a long, long time. So I've dusted it off re-edited slightly and Jim, Josh's father will be my guest on the uh, the Extra Mile today and here's a little of what's coming up on this week's Extra Mile I think the most important thing it brings is the ability to take a break from daily life so regardless of what's going on if you're, you're stressed about something, you're worried about something you can redirect yourself into that viewfinder And all of a sudden, everything else becomes separate and you're focused entirely on that image, composition, exposure. And uh, you're so totally engrossed in that image that the worries, even for, uh, and they're not necessarily going to go away, but just for a short period of time, they get put aside. That's Jim Solos, who will be on The Extra Mile. The Extra Mile is part of our private Patreon channel, supported by our wonderful community, who we call Extra Milers. There's an extra show each week, and it uh, often features our community as stars of that show. And this will be one such time, really. Uh, But if you'd like to support the show, because uh, it's your support that makes all the difference... To, uh, to being able to present it, then head over to the website, as they say, head over to the website, photowalk.show. In the top right-hand corner, there's an orangey, yellow, orangey button that says support the show. And it takes you to a page um, to help you understand what that's all about and a bit about the extra mile as well. As for the letter you just heard, well, there's certainly a fragility to this life thing, isn't there? It's, uh, it's letters like that that do serve to remind me that whilst, yes, the day-to-day of paying bills and worrying about the next dime and the next bill oof, and so on is part of life, actually, the greater focus, full pun intended, is the adventure of life itself, all the, the bumps in the road that it might figuratively and literally bring to, to some of us. Really, that, uh, that letter, Josh, has, has completely floored me today. Let's talk about Scotland, shall we? Yes, let's do that. 
We've been back from the uh, the annual photo walk retreat in Scotland for a month or so now, which is a visit for three years I've absolutely adored. The photo walkers I've spent time with, I like to think, will remain um, friends long after our adventures and our chats and time out with our cameras in Scotland. I run it with my good friend Lynn Fraser, an extra miler, an adventurer, and each year we've been sure to retain the wonderful spirit of our weeks whilst just working in some new ideas and um, new experiences as well. This year, one of our returning photo walkers, uh, as I said a couple of weeks ago, uh, suggested that um, a word to call the retreats, um, it was Judith McDermott who said, senses, it feels like it's, it's sort of that this week has been a part of all my senses. So uh, that was it. There was a light bulb at the time, as I said before, and um, it's now called Senses, our Scottish retreats. Um, so in 2025, we'll continue with the popular parts of the week, like the lock visits, our walks along the black water, through the beautiful woodland. And um, to engage all our senses on this, this retreat, we're going to do a further creative writing experience and some forest bathing with our thoughts. There'll be a new sound workshop to discover how our pictures and sound can work together. Plus, we're going to talk about how to bring our photography onto a more tactile plane with uh, bookmaking and zine production, some chats about them. In the, in the evening so uh, I'm thoroughly looking forward to it it's a, it's a stay on a wonderful part of the highlands of Scotland on the Black Isle near Inverness far enough away to make this a true retreat with rail and road and flight links conveniently close to make it easy to get to as well the barn that we stay in has private bedrooms wonderful nightly meal is prepared for us with the opportunity to share and talk about our work and experiences now a second week of dates is available since the first week has completely sold out all gone now so um, we've got two spaces already gone of the five in the second week so if you're interested go to photowalk.show photowalk.show and you'll find a form on there to reserve your place scotland 25 i am counting down the weeks how many weeks is it then neil oh you sound like a fact checker <laughs> nobody likes a smart alec I'm counting down the weeks. Is that good enough? All right then, Neil. That's fine. Okay, we'll let you get away with that. Haven't been making many sketchbook pictures, have I? Should we make one? Yeah, let's just show you where I'm walking today. There's uh, a fair bit of sunshine. It's nice. Uh, it's what, what I call those Toy Story or Toy Story um, sky, you know, blue with puffy clouds not quite as blue as a toy story sky but getting there let me put your letters and things down and uh, i'll get a picture of the path ahead the path more traveled actually this one because it's one i come to quite often i've not got woof with me this week yes um so bark a lot went out with me earlier on today and uh, i've come out on this extra photo walk on me todd 160 shutter speed f4.5 iso 160 a picture along the path let's get it from the other direction who was it that said look behind you look behind you a couple of weeks ago here we go another one and there we go so oh it was john anderton wasn't it that said that mr anderton john anderton yes um if you'd like to send in your thoughts, your pictures, where you've been travelling with your camera, I would love to hear from you. Stories at photowalk.show is the email address. If you can resize your pictures to 2,500 pixels, you are a star. If you can't, do not worry. I will do the, the heavy lifting for you. And remember to send me uh, links as well to your Vero or your Instagram. Or um, I can't bring myself to call it X. I just can't. Your Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that probably, well, he'll not listen to this show, but I, I'm sure he's, it's X. It's not Twitter, it's X. I renamed it. It's always Twitter to me. And, uh, oh, Neil. Uh, and uh, also your websites. I'd love to obviously be able to, to, uh, to link back to, to your stuff that you have online. Right. Same address, stories at photowalk.show for sending your pictures to this month's assignment. The, uh, there's a one-word assignment for the whole of this year. 
I'm, uh, I'm not sure whether to continue with assignments next year. Do you want me to continue with them? Let me know. Um, we've been doing them for quite a while now. Maybe there's... I did have an idea for something else. But uh, it's been one word assignments this year. One word. And the word this month and last month, because it sort of... Well, it, it didn't sort of. It ran across two months because of everything going on, what with retreats, etc. The one word is change. Change. It was set by Gary Williams. I'm almost there now with all the pictures you've been sending in, uploading them. But uh, think about the word change, which could be, well, you can interpret it as you wish. Is it seasonal? Is it a change in terms of people? Maybe something personal? Maybe mechanical? Dare I say political? But cha change is the word. Send in your, uh, your pictures of change. Right, in the first half of my chat with my guest, Howard Barlow, we would oh, look at that, the sun, hang on. The sun's just gone. Boo! There's a choir. There's another Mel Brooks choir just appearing out of the bushes. Look at that. The sun is just... Oh, no. Pick up my, my letters. Throwing them in a puddle almost. Uh, and it's just really illuminated the path. Look at that. Right. Another sketchbook. Very quickly. I've had to... Um, just because I'm along quite a dark path and then the sun just breaks into the um it just shoots through the the gap there onto the the path that i'm about to walk along that looks fantastic i love that it's like a funnel i think we talked about that funnel a couple of weeks ago yes in the first half of my chat uh with uh, my guest howard barlow we talked about awards uh, but very briefly and there, there was a question i i wish we could have expanded on only because it's something that's come up in conversation recently really i think uh I think I chatted about it with um, my photojournalist friend, Jason Florio. Um, the question of awards in the face of adversity, not necessarily for the, for the photographer, but for those who are the subject of, of the pictures. And I, I'm not sure I'm as qualified, really, to, um, to give you a, an opinion on that, having not won the type of award I'm referring to. But our friend, Marissa Roth, has. So I, um, I dropped a line to her a couple of nights ago and said, you wouldn't mind just coming on and, and um, having a chat about this subject, would you? And she said yes. Marissa, I, I think you're very well placed to answer this question as you're part of a team that won one of the highest photographic accolades there is, really, for your coverage of the LA riot. The, the loss of life, the injuries, the, the total amount of damage was huge. I wanted to get your thoughts about awards for work that cover people in adversity. I mean, Vietnam rings particularly true here. World Press Photo Awards, etc., where, where you've covered events that have at the end of it somebody who's suffered or is suffering greatly in life and how that feels as a photographer to win an award in that circumstance. Well, I think what you're also asking is... The reciprocity of that is how does a photographer actually do that kind of work? How do they come away from it, you know, emotionally, psychologically? Um, you know, there was always uh, sort of questions circling, you know, if you're a photojournalist and you see somebody in a dire situation, do you put down your camera and help them or do you take the photograph? You know, that's also, and I'm sure that's coming up for a lot of photographers who are covering Gaza and Israel and Ukraine at the moment. You know, it's like you're there to do a job. You know, you're there to document a horrible situation. So it's, you know, there, there are these constant contradictions. But I think, I think losing sight of one's own empathy or compassion is probably, you know, the trickiest part. I mean, a lot of photographers in a, in a, in a tough situation, I think, First and foremost, you're the photographer. You're there in this heightened situation, which is often so charged that it, it's probably going to yield more dramatic or interesting images because every fiber of your body is like electrified. Your adrenal system is exploding, so to speak. And I think to win an award for it, I mean, I, I know, you know, the Pulitzer is not just awards for the individual photographer, but it's, it's an award for, you know, whatever publication it is that you're 
working for. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an accolade that shows mastery of what you've accomplished. But again, I think it's the, it's how you take it in personally. You know, I think, you know, for me, photographing the riots, and then I was also part of the team that uh, created that five-part special that the LA Times actually, which is what we won for. Um, it was a there was a five-part section that came out about two weeks after the riots and um i was my one of my photographs was the lead photograph and then i was also part of the editing team so i think there was you know we were we were excited about it you know we, everybody had worked really really hard you know everybody had put their lives on the line you know photographers were getting beat up hit over the head um, during the riots, gear was stolen, you know, everybody, you know, it was, it was a scary moment. But I think, again, it's complicated. Um, and there was a young photographer named Kevin Carter who went to the Sudan in 1992 to photograph the, the famine in the Sudan. And he took a, quite a jarring photograph of a, a little boy who was starving, sort of, hunched over on the ground and there was a vulture in the background and of course the implications of the photograph was you know we know what they were and the photograph was published in the new york times and um they won a pulitzer prize for it he won a pulitzer prize and tragically he committed suicide four months after the award and it was stated that he was in a severe depression and i think that he sort of was an example, you know, there's a lot of young photographers who, you know, will go to a war zone or they'll go to an extreme humanitarian event to photograph, you know, kind of put themselves on the map as a photographer, so to speak, without fully understanding the consequences of it you know, emotionally, psychologically, physically. Um, Dan Eldon was another young photojournalist who was killed, who was beaten to death in Mogadishu, I think in 1996, uh, covering an uprising. So I know these, that's slightly off to the side of what we're talking about here, but I think it's the question of how does a photographer balance their own work, their own ambition, their own uh, capacity for empathy, compassion, or not, you know, are some photographers so detached from the experience that they're just doing their work and then, you know, they come back and it's, you know, there's a certain bravado. So I think it's deeply personal for each, each photographer, you know, and then also, you know, different people have different emotional ranges. Some people can compartmentalize their emotions their entire life whatever they may be you know others i like myself i i can't compartmentalize my emotions i mean i'm steady but you know my emotions let's say will always be a part of my tool chest so to speak let's say in my women and war work i i feel a communion with these women sometimes and i feel a level of emotion it does it never colors the photo session or the interview but there's a level of compassion there which also enables me to connect with them um so you know again i think it's it's personal for every photographer but you look at some people's work you know you look at knockway you feel he's feeling something whatever it is then there's the question that's i've been asked of salgado how do you explain taking a beautiful photograph of something horrifying and my thanks to Marissa Roth for talking to me about that subject of awards in photojournalism. Now, before I return to my conversation with uh, Howard Barlow, a letter from Mark Christensen, who's, um, who's been to the contact page on the website. And uh, as a conversation starter, I put some, well, there's a, a short list of, of questions on that page because um, your letters and your thoughts along with your pictures are really precious and the very reason I make these uh, these photo walk shows so I thought I'd make life a little bit easier and give you some conversation starters otherwise <laughs> I might never hear from you and I'd be all the poorer for that to be honest so Mark Christensen here from California land says Mark can I suggest a name for you to chat with on the show you certainly can Colette Stevenson because her work is terrific and she dabbles in several areas of photography and, get this, acting. 
I've got an Instagram address here, and I've also got the website, which I will put onto the the uh, the show page today. And uh, I will uh, enjoy with several Garibaldis later on this evening having a, a good look at Colette's work. Um, I think I'll answer some of your inspiration questions while I'm here, though. Says Mark. What do I enjoy photographing? Well, my favourite is nature and landscapes. Oh, and surfing. Right now I'm experimenting with a lot of food photography, which is really interesting. I've never tried street. Kind of scares me, even though I'm six foot six and my wife tells me my general face isn't happy. I try, Neil, I really do. Don't worry about the resting face, Mark. <laughs> it's what I call the face of concentration. I, um, I have very much the same at weddings sometimes. I have had people come up and say, you all right, mate? I say, yes, I am. Oh, you, you, you looked a bit... I'm thinking, what did I look? This is my face of concentration. I'm looking... I'm waiting for a moment to happen. Like you, Mark. The face of concentration. What wonderful or strange things have happened to you when making pictures? I'll go with wonderful, says Mark. My wife and I took our family of five on a six-week road trip from California to Maine and back. One of our stops was in South Dakota and Custer State Park. One morning I went out alone before sunrise, I don't like where this story's going, to photograph morning animals and the sunrise. I should mention that uh, I did get caught in a bison jam, which took forever to get through. For some reason I was picturing you in a bison jam. I thought, what? Well, it's some sort of large pot of jam. I went off in a very strange direction there. Not much was catching my eye, says Mark, as I drove, so I, I turned and headed back. To my surprise, one of the most skittish large animals in that area, a pronghorn, was standing in a field about 50 foot from the road. So I grabbed my camera and shot as I drove slowly by. Eventually, though, I stopped, and it never moved. I got out very slowly, still didn't move, and I photographed, thinking any second is going to take off. But long story short, I ended up sitting in the grass with this pronghorn, about 40 foot or so now between us, because eventually he sat down and just looked at me. The sun rose to my back and glowed off the pronghorn's beautiful features. I will never, ever forget that blessing of time with that pronghorn. How has making photographs changed your life? Um... I'll have to get back to you on that one, Neil. It, it'd be a very long answer. Come to California, I'll buy you a cup of coffee and I'll tell you my story. I tell you what, I'm very tempted by that. I re if this really was how I earned my living, full stop, sometimes those sort of requests, I'd say, do you know what? Yeah, why not? Let's make this work. How does photography and walking make you feel? Well, Neil, it's amazingly peaceful. It opens worlds to me. I try not to go out with a singular focus, so I take way too much gear. I want my macro, my wide angle, my telly. I love being ready for whatever the walk has to offer. It sounds like you could have almost used the macro for the pronghorn. And then what is your why? Well, my why is because I can't help it. It's the first thing that comes to mind. I see things, and it's almost a physical or muscular movement inside me that has to do what I can with what I'm seeing. And that really is the short of that answer. To wrap up, thank you for your podcast. I promise to become an extra miler soon because I really do love what you've created here. Um, Mark, thank you for your answers. Thank you for the intro to another photographer, for the why, and also actually for a lesson in, in wildlife. Every day is a school day, they say, and um, I think today has been one. I now know what a pronghorn is. You didn't know what a pronghorn is, Neil. No, I didn't. Um, I was a bit low in my pronghorn knowledge stakes. I'd say tick in box. So thank you for that. And talking of the why, I like it when a story comes together. In this second part of my chat with Howard Barlow, who you've met already, my photojournalist studio guest this week, I will, of course, be posing the, the why question at the tail end of our chat. Here's Howard Barlow, part two. You have a particular passion for street photography. With your keen nose for a news story, I, I wonder if it, if it gives you a different approach to shooting street, whether you... Whether when you go onto the street, you think, right, what, what story can I form here? As opposed to 
just shooting straight. It's a bit like that, isn't it? Yes, I think you're looking at characters. And again, you, we mentioned patience before, isn't it? Sometimes you see a situation and you think, well, if you know, if, if only that element would, would come into the picture or, or, or uh, if there was only a person in front of that bit of graffiti, and that's where the patience comes in, isn't it? In terms of arts and theatre, I spied, and listeners of a certain geographical location um, may need to follow a link to his name, but... Um, I saw the portrait of Eric Sykes. Dear Eric Sykes, he he was an absolute comedy hero of mine. I only learned of late that he was profoundly deaf. I knew that he did suffer with, with hearing loss, but I, I didn't realise that those trademark glasses that he, he had were, uh, were a sort of bone-conducting hearing aid when I did some research on it. And what was he like to photograph? He was great. Yeah, I think it was, it was in Liverpool backstage at the Royal Court Theatre or something at Blackpool. Yeah, and, and he was, you know, obviously the, the, there was a mirror in front of him and he, he, I remember he had those those socks, uh, those sort of triangle diamond-shaped socks that he always wears. Yeah, he was a lo- lovely guy. Well, what are celebrities like to photograph, comics in particular? You've, you've photographed a fair few. Yes, um, Peter Kay in, 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 uh, for, for the Sunday Times for a, for a feature for them once. I met him in, in Bolton. He, he was famous. He was probably not as famous as he was later in year, but um, he, he was still a household name. And uh, I met him up in um, in Bolton, where he comes from, and we wandered around. And yeah, people recognised him. And uh, mm. but he was he was a great guy. He wasn't married to his current wife. Well, his, his wife is called Susan, but she was his girlfriend at the time. And I remember we were doing some photograph the photograph shoot, and then he suddenly remembered he had to go and get Susan's. Um, uh, lunch so we had to pop off to a sandwich shop and then take them into boots where i think it was boots where susan was working i'm intrigued marceau marceau the mime artist there's a super portrait of him i do want to know if he spoke um, i think i think he's one of the character you know you, you kind of hold your camera up at marceau marceau and he just goes into this automatic actions with his hands and that and uh yeah he was doing a, a, a performance at the palace theater in manchester and uh he, yeah, he was a lovely guy yes I'm not, I'm not sure if he did speak much i remember that i think the week after i photographed rudolf nuriev the yeah. ballet dancer yeah. at the palace theater and um he i think it was his first trip to uh to, to manchester and it was a summer summer day we used to have summer in those days, <laughs> back in uh, back in the August, and um, he wanted to have a look around Manchester and have a look at the uh, sights and that. And um, I said, "Well, I'll will take you around and show you." So I took him around, and uh, it was quite bizarre. I think we we went up the road, and I uh, bought him an ice cream um, on Oxford Road. Uh, quite bizarre, isn't it? So it's nice sometimes when you you do have that relationship with uh, some of the people you photograph and uh, get to know them a little bit more. How, how do you approach approach moments like that when you're going into um, portraits with 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 fairly famous people? Is there is there a patter, Howard, or is is are you, are you a talkative photographer? I, I know some photographers are can be quite reserved when it comes to direction. Yeah, I am quite reserved, really. I think I, I kind of like people to uh, to be themselves. Yeah, sometimes you need to sort of stage things a little bit, don't you, in terms of background. I photograph lots of footballers, and you know, pe- some people think, they like to think you, you know them, and uh, it's an honour to photograph them. I remember there was a cricketer, uh, there was an England cricket captain at Old Trafford, and, um, you know, he expected everybody to know him. I, I walked into the uh, the clubhouse at uh, Old Trafford, and uh, I went up to him and I said, excuse me, do you know da, 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 his I, name? I, <laughs> and, uh, I, I do enjoy your, your political work. You do have an eye for for the cheeky now i thought it was michael foot but it's uh, nicholas ridley picking his nose um on stage and though that's a picture you could say is a, a nod to the wonderful ridiculousness that is life pictures like this can shape uh, and form opinion can't they they can paint a, a narrative I, I think as photographers we we have a great ability to have a potential impact on people's public outgoing persona don't we yeah I, nicholas ridley yes you could say it was a cruel picture w- with him picking his nose but um i mean some would say that he introduced he was the minister responsible for introducing the poll tax so he was you know maybe fair game i don't know that's that's a bit cruel as well isn't it but yes a picture can tell a, a big story sometimes and and can be used by a picture editor to to, to suggest a storyline are you looking for for moments like that is is there you know behind that lens you think got it that that's it we can all go home for tea i mean just thinking of political stories again um sometimes you do don't you yes uh, eric heffer was the uh a labor mp who was on the executive of the labor group and he got kicked off 
the um, the executive on on the day of the conference in Blackpool, and uh, I photographed him. And uh, yeah, I think you you had to have a kind of a, an expression to reflect that mood that he'd been thrown off the. Uh, thrown out of the, uh, the the executive. What are the conferences like? I mean, we've just been through the, the huge, massive one in the States, the Democratic Party conference. They are a, a very different breed to the conferences that you probably cut your photographic teeth photographing. They're, they, are, they are different. They were a smaller affair at that particular time, but they are interesting, aren't they? fascinating places to be. I love, I love the party conferences, yes. I used to cover them all for the independent uh, paper and uh yeah in blackpool and a couple in brighton as well but i, I don't know i mean the personalities were i felt were, were great personalities in those days and the trade union com- conferences people like arthur scargill yeah I and mean, just the people going to the conferences i think you know going photographing the green party conference or something like that and there would be people knitting in the front row and changing babies and nappies and things like that or, or they're um, or they're asleep as i saw one of your pictures has a few people in the front front row sleeping yes i think it was that was i think barbara castle wasn't it yes i mean yes they're long days aren't they um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but no i just i just love the whole thing about you know staying over in blackpool and um covering all the fringe meetings and uh yeah say great character great character and i love that competition of you know all all the other newspapers had their photographers there mm. and you were all vying for the the front cover for the next morning's paper i think nowadays it tends to be you know it's all it's all party conference it might be the getty shot uh, mm. uh, that would be used on the same picture on all the cover covers of the papers whereas in those days it was more yeah i think the newspapers wanted their staff photographer or their contract photographer in my case to come up with the front page picture and uh yeah i found that i found that very exciting that that competition with with the other photographers um, I'm intrigued by the inclusion of wedding photographs in, in your portfolio. For many casual observers, the idea of news, rock and roll and politicians and weddings uh, make, make for an unusual, if I could use the phrase, bed partner. Um, I, I sense you're going to have a different opinion about this, though, that um, it's all part of photography. There's a very sort of stuffy um, attitude towards wedding photography, isn't there? Maybe in the old days. I don't know about now. I mean, no, it's... Uh it's very much, isn't it, that documentation thing, the, the photojournalistic approach. The first, the first wedding I photographed was for the Telegraph, which was an escapologist um, who was getting married to this lady. And uh, they, they had their wedding at the top of the uh, Blackpool Tower. So we had to kind of climb up. the. Once you get to the top of Blackpool Tower in the lift, there's another little area that you had to climb up, virtually climbing up the scaffolding or an old ladder. And uh, the, the bride and groom were dangling off the edge of the uh, thing. So I've not got a great head for height. So that was uh, a daunting experience. And I think the second photograph I photographed was for um, wedding was for um, Hello Magazine. had asked me to photograph uh, Pete Waterman's Pete wedding. Waterman, yeah. Um, and that was, again, you know, thrown into the deep end, as it were. But um, I, I think, yeah, I, I, I never kind of went out to see doing wedding photography, but I did enjoy it. You know, the, the times that I did, I used probably photographed about six weddings a year. And uh, I did love that approach of being, you know, the fly on the wall, as it were. But I, th- I found it very hard because I think, you know, as much as you want to not set anything up, not stage anything, I think for the sake of the family and, and your sense, you, you, you know, I felt I had to do the, the odd group to make sure you did get in Cousin Jack or, or, or the great auntie or the uncle that uh, you might have missed if you hadn't have uh, asked or done that group. Away from photography, you're, you're a keen road cyclist. Does, that, does this mean there's going to be a series of cycling portraits I, I, we've not yet seen or yet to see? <laughs> I have got a great love for cycling, yes. I, I tend not to do so many photographs. We uh, we have a club and uh, we're, we're off to Mallorca in, in four weeks' time and I'm sure I'll be taking lots of pictures of, of uh, up the big uh, mountains up in Mallorca. But I did set up a, a, an Instagram page called Like a Cycler. I like the idea of just carrying a little camera around with me on bike rides and uh, photographing that kind of bike culture, you know, which is hanging around cafes and uh, climbing mountains. Is there a most um, impactful or um, or memorable assignment that you've covered? I feel like I, I may have asked you to choose something like your favourite colour, but, but in all the images that you've photographed, the politicians, the musicians, the news stories, is there something that's left an indelible mark on you? I think two, two of my kind of favourite pictures are probably almost that, that street photography style. There was one on the website, there's a, there's a young man with a bunch of flowers waiting outside a corner shop. And it was a feature about corner shops for uh, the Sunday Times. So I had to go around the north of England looking for interesting corner shops 
and there was this one particular corner shop in Colm uh, near Burnley and uh, it was on the kind of a crossroads and there was a cobble street and terraced houses etc behind but there was this young man with a bunch of flowers obviously waiting for his girlfriend and I photographed him you know obviously he, he saw me taking a picture but he didn't sort of flinch or anything and then I wandered off and I think it, I came back about 45 minutes to an hour later and, uh, and he was still there with his bunch of flowers <laughs> and uh, you often I love that intrigue of you know thinking well you know did did she turn up at all or <laughs> happily married now or yeah it's I love that that kind of interesting story of not knowing and there's another story another picture with um, a young boy in a burnt out car oh, in, in, yes, yeah. in Manchester which uh, again you know it was a, a speedway travelling circus that came to Manchester and uh, it was just in a disused car park and a burnt out car and this young lad who was probably about I don't know but about eight sat behind the uh, the wheel of the car and scribbled on the side was MUFC Manchester United FC OK but again I just you know people say well you should go and find out you know that was 50 40 50 years ago you should find out what this eight year old boy is doing now you know but um, I love that intrigue of not knowing I think I think it's more mystical as it were yeah. to not know who he is I mean he could be in strange ways prison he could be a member of the cabinet or I like that idea of not knowing rather than finding out after all these years Howard I'm going to ask you a question which I, I pose to many photographers which is why why, why do you do it why, why is photography so precious to you I, I suppose it's the creative creative side in me that documentation isn't it you know that going back looking at those street pictures looking at the music pictures you know the Ramones and people like that the, they just can't be done again now yeah I just love documenting things I, I love binding something out of a out of a situation you know to have my eye maybe a different a different look at a subject than somebody else I, I just love to document document life and uh, as, as I see it and that could be you know photographing my my grandchildren nowadays or or it could be you know just wandering around Manchester with a camera and uh, finding characters yeah finding characters like I, going back to the rag and bow man again you know he's probably known to many many people during his life and yet probably died a good number of years ago and, and completely forgotten about but when people perhaps look at the photograph of him again that I took he, can, he comes to life again those memories come back so memories you know for me but also memories for people that look at the photographs of uh, how life used to be or what that band used to be like 40 years ago and my thanks to Howard Barlow for being our studio guest this week and that's it for today if you can't wait until next Friday uh, when I have a special walk and talk guest uh, as I walk with um, the photographer Chris Floyd uh, and you'd like to walk a little bit further together now, then the Extra Mile edition number 111 is waiting for you. Now, the newsletter, I mentioned the new, new, new newsletter uh, last week. There is a new, new, new newsletter, and it's on Substack. I've decided to join what I think is a fabulous, fabulous community of writers and authors and photographers. And um, Substack gives me a chance to utilise sound and video there too from time to time. Um, which I couldn't on the older newsletter. It's um, a much easier thing for me to do on the back of producing the show each week as well on Substack. So if you'd like to receive the, uh, the, the newsletter, I would be very pleased to uh, hear from you. Just go to the front of the, uh, the website, photowalk.show, and there is a, a way to subscribe to the newsletter there. Our PS is to come. But before that, we need a play-out song just to make some final frames to our think about what has been said today. I'll ask you to cast your thoughts back to my opening letter now from Michael Brennan's Go Photo uh, playlist that he mentioned on Spotify, which um, has many of the final tunes that we play as our play-out songs. And there is one that I would like to revisit, since it was, I think, the second one on your list, which is... Um, well, usually we use Artlist for pretty much all of our music, but there's another service I use called Epidemic Sound from time to time. And within that realm of beautiful sounds and music is a song by Velvet Moon, which is called Good Man. I like a bit of country, and this is a great song by Velvet Moon. You don't have to be smart. No need to dress up for me to see that you're a good man you're a good man 
real good man When the wind blows And the windows are closing You let the world know What it's been, has been and There's no use In looking back Going back Wishing back Cutting rice and chopping wood Romantic Sipping coffee under the apple tree It's gentle manly Well you're a good man Quite the best man A real fine man Velvet Moon with Good Man. Um, cracking song. Go to the show page today and the Go Photo playlist is on there as a uh, pictorial link. I've got a feeling as I'm reading your letters and thoughts today that this might have been a longer show. If it's no longer than the normal one, well, it just felt like it was as I've been recording your thoughts. I think I may have been... Uh, I may have been digressing a bit with my thoughts as the show's gone along. I don't know. But uh, thank you for... <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me, if it has been. Just a few closing thoughts before the PS. My sincere thanks to you, if you are or you're about to become an extra miler. We'll keep building this wonderful community of kindness in the photographic and walking well together. A safe place to share our thoughts about this thing that we do. Photographing and walking. My, um, my thanks to Neil Ford, who looks after IT admirably. Andrea Gilpin, who is across Instagram and Kelly Mitchell, who looks after our Facebook members. And uh, you'll need a postscript for the show, won't you? Today, it's one from Nelson Mandela, and it's about resilience. I have a feeling that this man knew quite a lot about resilience. Um, and in places, resilience has certainly been a sub-theme of the show today. So the PS is this. The greatest glory lies not in staying on one's feet, but rising after falling. The Photo Walk is a Loading Zone production.